All right, folks, we have started. Um, this is the first of the lectures that is in the new remote format. This is going to be a new experience for all of us. So let's go through magazines, the power of words and images. Uh, first, we need to define the term. What's a magazine? And unlike a newspaper, a magazine hangs around a while, so it's a publication of lasting interest. Furthermore, although you would not know it from Benjamin Franklin's first magazine, uh, a, a magazine is targeted at a specific audience. Uh, people who ride bicycles, people who like gourmet food, people who are interested in fashion. The first American magazine, it's sort of a tie, a dead heat is the term for that, between my favorite father, uh, Benjamin Franklin, and Andrew Bradford. The Saturday Evening Post and magazines like it, which go, I don't know, way back, 1821, that's 40 years before America's Civil War, uh, before California is part of the United States. The Saturday Evening Post began as a magazine uh, angled a, a, a bit toward middle class women. Note. This is the first truly mass medium. While we're on uh, the subject of the post, let me do a shout out for uh, Norman Rockwell, who did painted an amazing number of covers. Uh, he has created a form of art that uh, is, is emblematic of traditional cement, uh, um, sentimentalized Americana. Magazines like the Post, they began to lose relevance, not so much because they, they lost readers, but because they lost advertisers. You know, when you think about these magazines, they were uh, uh, platforms for national advertisers, and pretty good ones, until network television came along and did it better. The birth of photojournalism. Photography goes back to the 1830s in France. By the mid 19th century, uh, in the U.S., there were portrait photographers in the U.S., and they, they did nice work. They would take pictures of the family and their prized possessions, or of. Uh, somebody who had a business in town and maybe the tools of their trade. But Matthew Brady uh, figured out how to use photography uh, to document you know, something deadly serious, the Civil War. Now, please note that uh, given the photo equipment of the time, Mr. Brady you know, couldn't pop his head up out of a foxhole and then snap a, a, a photo and then go back down. He would have died the first day and the photos wouldn't have been very good. But he could show the aftermath of battles. And this certainly did create a dose of realism that a lot of Americans hadn't seen before. What this has to do with magazines is that Harper's, a very influential magazine for a long, long time, that Harper's was running Brady's photos even before uh, the war was over. This, by the way, is from the Battle of Antietam. That's a battlefield in, in Maryland. It is now a, a, a national park. The Muckrakers. They were a group of progressive journalists right around the turn of the 20th century. And they were investigative reporters. Uh, they were not just about getting sent out to an event and telling you what happened. They looked at 
excesses, uh, in many cases by the uh, leading industrialists in American society. You know, I hate to think that that muckraking tradition is over. Um, in the chat, uh, tell me, are there any journalists today whose work reminds you of the muckrakers of 125 years ago? Henry Luce and the birth of the Time Life Empire. Mr. Luce, back in the 1920s, conceptualized a weekly magazine for a busy middle class professional, maybe a fellow who was uh, taking a commuter train into the big city and had an hour or so to browse a magazine that would curate for him, select for him, you know, the stories that he really ought to know something about, the situations around the country and around the world that are, you know, truly important. Uh, this Time magazine was a great success. Uh, Henry Luce followed it up not too many years later with Fortune, which is considered to be the, uh, the first modern business magazine, and like Time, it is still around today. Life Magazine was just was just fascinating. Life Magazine was a beautiful thing physically. It was on high quality paper. It was oversized pages and it was a showcase of the best in professional journalism. Life Magazine uh, was uh, uh, extremely influential after President Kennedy's assassination on November 22, 1963, for example. Life obtained the rights to the what's turned out to be the, the famous uh, Zap Ruder film, which better than anything else can give us clues as to what happened on that fateful day. Well, Life magazine was able to reprint frames of the Zap Ruder film, individual frames, so that its readers could take a look for themselves and try to figure out what, what happened to President Kennedy. All right, we're going to, going to move to magazines today. This is uh, taken from um, a cover of the New Yorker magazine a few years ago. And uh, obviously it's meant to be a little facetious, but I, I, I think there's some, some truth to it. That I think that if you took some of these titles and you, know, you maybe made it a little less mocking, you could have a real magazine there. I'll, I'll give you a very simplified formula for, you know, could you have a profitable magazine? Well, you need two things. You need a group of people who would say, you know what, I am so interested in, um, well, we'll say young women who are interested in horses, that there would be enough of them that say, you know, I'd buy a magazine about and then a group of advertisers who would say, oh my gosh, uh, a group of young women, uh, 15 to 34, who are very interested in the equestrian lifestyle. Whoa, there's stuff that we can sell to them and their horses. I mean, if you have those two things, you have the potential uh, for a profitable magazine. Uh, of the traditional media, magazines, okay, maybe books, are perhaps the most specialized. Let's move to types of magazines. Now this first type of magazine is going to sound like every magazine to you. The consumer magazine targets like-minded consumers. In this case, 760,000 runners per month. They care about it so much that uh, they will buy a magazine about it. 
And you can see that a lot of the common magazines that you see on the newsstand or that you may read fall into this idea of consumer magazines. Now, please note, um, you may not want every consumer magazine, but it's available to you if you want it. And of course, what makes these magazines profitable is not just people buying the magazine, but also those advertisers who would say, oh, gee, all those people who are interested in running, well, I'll bet they would buy you know, our clothing or uh, our energy drinks, or maybe they want, might want to enter our big city marathon or what have you. Here's another type of magazine. This is probably one you don't think about. The trade magazine. It goes out to everybody in a particular business or a particular trade. Uh, I, I started my, my professional career as a journalist working for a trade magazine. We were a thing called Western Floors. Uh, it was a magazine that went out to people in the western states who were involved with the floor covering industry. Yeah, not very exciting. Pizza Today goes out to people who own pizza restaurants. And it's not that they buy the magazine. It is what they call controlled circulation. And what that means is if you are on the list, you get the magazine for free pretty much forever. You'd say, well, how does that work as a business plan? Well. How it works is that the advertisers really want to get at those 15,000 people who need to buy stuff for their pizza restaurants. Here's another type of magazine that is in your chapter 5. Literary and commentary magazines. I remember being in English class, both in high school and as an undergraduate, reading yet another short story and wondering, where did these things originally appear? Well, literary magazines is one answer. Commentary magazines are uh, for serious uh, uh, political essays. The Nation, for example, has been around since the Civil War years. It is a liberal left magazine and it has a particular focus on racial justice. I sometimes have conservative students who, who, who will ask me, you know, what would, what would be a good conservative uh, commentary magazine? Well, I can tell you that the traditional leading magazine for conservative thought is, is the National Review. Uh, if you are of a more libertarian bent, there is reason. Here's a type of magazine that isn't in the book, uh, but they exist in the world, so therefore it is in this lecture. The public relations magazine is not around to make a profit. It is there to make the sponsoring institution or company or organization look good. So for example, with Trojan Family, it also goes out through controlled circulation. You know, all the living graduates of USC and probably a few of the dead ones too, uh, get this magazine. And as a public relations magazine, Oh gosh, nothing bad happens at the old alma mater. You say, well, you know, why would they be trying to, you know, burnish their reputation among people who've already graduated? Well, two reasons basically. One, they like return business. Send your children. Um, the other reason is they always have building funds that alumni can contribute to. Another type of magazine that isn't in the book, but that I definitely feel should be, is the academic journal, the scholarly journal. Now, 
you have a research paper this semester, um, you should be looking in academic journals, scholarly journals, uh, for sources. That is a, a prime source of good, um, good things to cite in a college research paper. One of the reasons why they are considered to be so authoritative is that they are peer-reviewed. And that means experts in a particular field will, will vet the article, review the article, and not just, you know, it's not about you know, misspelled words. It's about, is this a worthy contribution to the research on you know, whatever the subject is? So, as you continue to do your research for your term paper, look for articles in relevant, peer-reviewed, scholarly journals. When you think about a magazine cover, it's a sales pitch. It's a way to get the magazine to sell itself from the news rack. Annie Leibovitz is perhaps the, the most famous magazine photographer alive. And she has certainly done many high profile photo shoots. But I think that she is probably going to be best known for this really groundbreaking Vanity Fair cover. You know, for for you folks, my students who are younger, I, I, I know you think of uh, Caitlyn Jenner as this person who is uh, involved with the Kardashian family and is just somehow a celebrity, but you have to realize that Bruce Jenner, back in the 1970s, was considered perhaps the world's greatest athlete after he won the Olympic decathlon competition. But let's not get sidetracked. Uh, magazines really strive to have a strong cover because it is good for news rack sales. Cover lines. Cover lines also help to uh, sell the magazine off the news rack. Uh, cover lines basically say, pick me, pick me. Now, that said, uh, I don't think that there is a cover line that would attract literally everyone. Uh, so what a good cover line should do is attract the type of person who might buy that magazine. Magazines, especially fashion magazines, are hmm, in the business of fantasy. And, well, that has led to persistent uh, criticism that magazines perpetuate uh, unattainable body images. And I, I believe that, that, that some of the folks who are uh, depicted on the cover of, mag of uh, fashion magazines, it literally is unattainable. I mean, realize all the preparation that had to be done for this photo shoot. Uh, and then if, if the photos weren't perfect, well, there's always alteration. Of course, uh, there is always room for pushback that it might be good business, not just good social policy, but uh, good business to have advertising campaigns and other things that uh, depict more realistic uh, body image. So okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, put a question up here for, uh, uh, for chat. Let's see what we get. Women's magazines, fashion magazines, uh, are they really good for women? Or are they just good for the advertisers in the magazine. All right, let's talk about the advertising department 
versus the folks who write, edit, and photograph the stories. In newspapers, there's a term, the wall. Sometimes it's expressed by uh, another term, separation of church and state. Now that's, both of them are metaphors. Uh, what it means is, is in newspapers, there is a strong belief that advertising should not influence news coverage. In magazines, there is more of a belief in synergy. Can we create articles that will lead to the sale of more advertising? So my example here is Los Angeles Magazine, a, a magazine that is known to have had some financial problems down through the years. Uh, well, th their biggest issue of the year typically is their restaurant issue. Boy, that, there's a lot of synergy there. You can sell a lot of restaurant ads in the restaurant issue. This cover we're seeing here, uh, I will call the uh, the downtown gentrification issue. Well, you can imagine how many restaurants and uh, gastro pubs and uh, theaters and art galleries and so on and so forth are going to advertise in this. Let's uh, circle back a little bit to uh, magazine covers. You know, if you think about cover land, we will call it, you know, and who the citizens of cover land are. Well, there is research that indicates that cover land has historically been uh, a, a fairly uh, segregated place, uh, a, a place where people of color were and continue to be uh, underrepresented. Now that said, there are some uh, there are some encouraging signs that uh, there there is uh, at least according to your, your author Ralph Hansen that uh, that who gets to be on the cover it's becoming more diverse. Now, what you may want to think about here, and I'm going to put a discussion question up here in just a moment, is. Gosh, does it, does it really matter what the perceived race or ethnicity, or for that matter, gender, of the person um, on the cover of In Style, or Pizza Today, or Runner's World, or Trojan Family? I mean, does it matter? So please, put in the chat, why do you think it matters, or why do you think it doesn't matter? Well, let's, let's get to some uh, trends in the world of magazines. Magazines have always been segmented. Well, if anything, they're getting even more segmented. Uh, and I, I think what that is about is, you know, you think, you know, what are the, what's the competition uh, uh, for magazines? Well, more and more, it's YouTube channels and websites and blogs and things that are you know very very targeted please note a magazine just for ferrets although I guess I should say for ferret owners I don't think the ferrets actually read it magazines have always cared a little bit more about how they look than newspapers do and I, I think that especially for those magazines that are uh, uh, trying to maintain a presence on paper looking good, being just a beautiful thing on your coffee table, makes a difference. There are some magazines like uh, The New Yorker that have just amazingly long articles, but in general the trend is toward shortening articles. Uh, whether people are more busy than ever before, I don't know, but people perceive themselves as busier and shorter of time and 
maybe having less time to focus on a magazine article than ever before, and that has led to shorter articles. Well, it would be weird if magazines were not affected by the digital age. So let's come up with a few things on this. Newsweek, once the nation's number two news magazine, uh, has gone totally off of paper. It is now only online as a division of the Daily Beast. The New Yorker, uh, which is still going strong, when you subscribe, you get both the print edition and the electronic edition. Magazines are increasingly trying to be an all-encompassing expert or gathering spot uh, in regard to whatever it is they specialize in. So going back to uh, Runner's World from earlier this chapter, I, I happen to be a subscriber and I get emails almost every day uh, kind of coaxing me to their website where they will have additional articles and videos about something that pertains to running. Some magazines I think are becoming brands more than they are publications. The Atlantic, a uh, very old and well-respected magazine, still publishes on paper. But where I see the Atlantic now is uh, in the news aggregators. Google News or Apple Newsstand or something like that will have Atlantic branded articles. Well, this concludes the lecture on Chapter 5, Magazine.